She was a 19-year-old journalist. She had a book published. She was a 20-year-old journalist. She won her first award, a national award. She's won, you know, this many awards. She's the But it it definitely comes with a personal toll. Because I say to people, you see the highlights, right? You see the byline, you see the awards, you see the interviews and television. What you don't see is the depression of unable to get out of bed, the obesity that comes with depression, the inability to live a functioning life and have to literally outsource my life and actually not have a life outside of journalism. Welcome to another episode of Her Media Diary, a podcast that captures the lived experiences of African women working in media industries. I am Dr. MC Akimbobola, and in this episode, I'm joined by Quanita Hunter, politics editor at News24 in South Africa. She's also a mental health activist, co-author of Eight Days in July, Balance of Power, Ramaphosa, and the Future of South Africa. Today, Quanita and I discuss her work on mental health and the media. Thank you so much, um, Kanita Hunter. Thank you for doing this interview. Would you like to start off by telling us about yourself, what you do, etc.? Thank you very much for having me. I am Kanita Hunter. I am the political editor of News24 in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm uh, basically in charge of our political coverage on South Africa's biggest news site, News24. It's part of the Media24 stable. I've been covering politics for 10 years in South Africa and have done a little bit um, of reporting in in other countries, mostly from a South African foreign relations perspective. I've written a book on the president. A lot of my career had been focused on covering the office of the president. In 2019, I published a book called Balance of Power, Ramaphosa and the Future of South Africa on the incumbent president, Cyril Ramaphosa. Before that, when I was still a rookie reporter, I'd published a chiclet novel. (laughs) Okay. Uh, I'm not. I'm not kidding. Um, called Diary of a Goody Girl, which ironically did really well at the time, uh, even though I was extremely embarrassed about it as a political reporter. To that, you know, uh, the thing that uh, you know made me popular at the time was uh, was a chiclet uh, novel. But it was uh, obviously a learning experience, and I am currently a master's student at the University of Witwatersrand. Okay. I want to go back to the early years of Kanita Hunter just to really understand, you know, your background and where you come from. And I'm really interested in this. Um, did you call it a chiclet novel? Yeah, chiclet. So like a, uh, like a chick flick. Ch- right, right. I get you. <laughs> okay. And so how old were you when you did that, when you, when you wrote that? I was 19, I believe. 19. Wow. So my uh, start in journalism um, was completely uh, unorthodox because I literally, and I mean, you could call it faith, you could call it stupidity. I mean, (laughs) 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 probably a bit of both. But I mean, I always knew I wanted to be a journalist. So from the time I I remember listening to news and reading newspapers, and it's something I grew up with because we never watch television uh, as um, a form of entertainment in our home. So your options were reading books, reading newspapers, or listening to the radio. Uh, Or if you did watch television, it would be for the news. That was how our house was. And I became obviously very interested in politics at a very, very young age. And I was actually sent to a home school. So, so that was my, my early beginnings. And then um, after I had finished school, um, I didn't even wait for my results, got on onto a bus. I had emailed a few editors from different organizations. And I said, please, I will work for you for free because I had some months before I would have to start my tertiary education. And I really wanted to be this journalist and I couldn't care about university. And I literally stalked one man until he finally said, okay, you know, come along in. I was 17. I didn't even have a CV, I think, because I didn't even have my matric results. So I had like random courses that I did in school and, you know, nothing serious at all. And I convinced him that I will work for him for free and he doesn't have to pay me, even though I was in a new city. I was staying away. I I left home and I was just, you know, so determined to make it as a journalist. And my luck had it that a week into the job, the newsreader in the mornings had quit unexpectedly. And I was sort of thrown into that deep end and said, "Okay, just do it. Here you go. 
and I did everything in those years. I mean, I in, in my formative years, I've done uh, news reading, I did news production, I did pro lifestyle production. I then I started writing stories. Then. Uh, the, the, this news organization that I worked for didn't really focus too much on going on the ground. So if I wanted to go on the ground, I would have had to finish my work for the day, you know, read my news bulletins, produce my shows. And then, you know, I would take public transport and go down and try to cover a political event. And it was not something that was, uh, you know, I didn't have anyone guiding me. So I literally would just you know, take a taxi downtown and there'd be a protest and I'd try to report on it. And I would listen to how colleagues would do it. And then eventually I got an internship at a news paper. Again, I think how I got that internship was a miracle because I literally had my CV was first year of university and that was distance learning as well. By that time, I had covered so many political events because I was just so determined to do it. And so, and again, it took a lot of stalking from my part because I was up against like, you know, people with their master's degrees in communications and journalism. And I really wanted this internship. Again, was like, because by that time I was earning a salary. And so I took a 50% pay cut for a stipend and I was like, it's fine. Um, I was 18 and I was covering the president uh, and covering political events and... Yeah, I've been doing so for the last 10 years. So, right, there's so much in that kind of, you know, brief overview of what sounds as like a very exciting early years in journalism. But I want us to go all the way back, like all the way back to young Kanita, five years old Kanita, and really tell us about your early influences in those days. And it's really interesting that anytime I do these interviews, nine out of 10 times, there's always that I grew up reading newspapers, I grew up reading books and watching the news. So tell us how all of that shaped kind of you at the earliest ages. And I would really want to know about you in those early years. Yeah, so uh, like I said, you know, so I grew up in in a in a, in a city called Durban. It's a coastal city uh, in South Africa, and I grew up in a conservative Muslim home. And like I said, I was sent to a homeschool, so not a not a normal mainstream school. Um, all girls homeschool with very few kids, less than ten kids per class. So home homeschool basically is boarding school. No, no, no. So it's like sort of, you know, a tutors would come to someone's house and you would then you would then go to the school. Right. Like I said, you know, watching television for entertainment was just not something that we did in our house. And so what fascinated me is, you know, when I was much younger, we would, we, if I did watch television, it would be CNN. Uh, and then if it later on, it was Al Jazeera. And so I remember being like nine years old or so, and I'd, I'd take a hairbrush in, and, and lots of my aunts and friends can recall you know, practicing my sign off like Kanita Hunter, Al Jazeera, Beirut, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I was very little, I was very little. And, you know, it was um, later on when I was eventually uh, completing my, my high school, the main tutor that, you know, was um, in charge of, of, of the, 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 our curriculum, it was almost devastated because he was like, why would you want to become a journalist? You know, you, you, you're such an intelligent child and my, my, you know, my, my academic grades for someone who was homeschooled schooled um, was incredible and so, so it was like you know like what are you throwing your life away you know and then it, it was it was even worse when I had said I'm not going to university because that was the expectation of why I came to Joburg that I was just gonna sort of you know get a feel of what journalism was and then go to university and then I just thought I'm not going to university I will study part-time and then I'll just you know work as a journalist uh, for whoever will employ me and I'll make coffee if I have to but I'll do what I need to do <laughs> so what was it like? You said that you grew up in a conservative Muslim home. Yes. What was that like for you as a young girl? And, or, and what does that mean to you? I mean, it's, it's it's everything I knew. And I mean, like when I say to people that I came from a conservative Muslim home, but at the same time, when I describe my childhood, it almost feels like a paradox or, a, a, you know, juxtaposition of sort, because my parents were, were free thinkers, especially my mom. And she was very, very, very much into, you know, seize every opportunity do things. I mean, we were not very wealthy in comparison to the, probably the community that we lived in, but we were not, you know, short of any opportunities. And and I come from a big family. We, we six siblings. We had a few, you know, almost adopted kids that grew up with us and very politically conscious. And and I and I try to think where that comes from. And I don't really know. It was just that sort of the temperature because the society in which I grew up was not politically conscious at all. If anything, it, they were oblivious right to to the political dynamics of South Africa because of the class uh, you know being an elitist class etc 
So, but, but in our household, there was this political consciousness. There wasn't the sort of restriction of what you could be. And I often think about, you know, the fact that, that I had come from a relatively poor family and it was never a thing in my mind that I could never be a journalist. It was like, no, the world is your oyster, kind of. And, you know, like I said, the radio was a very big part of our growing up. So, we you know, we'd huddle around the radio and we'd have discussions about it because I had older sisters and an older sister who was also involved, not involved, but also interested in, in the news and, and politics. And so we'd have, you know, we'd watch or, or we'd listen uh, to CNN. I remember, you know, in the early 2000s after, you know, what, what happened in the US politics and, 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 you know, have discussions about that. You know, I was very young and I would um, maybe 12 or 13 and I would go downtown um, when there would be a political rally just to see what it's like, you know, and maybe have a glimpse of the then form of deputy president, you know, who was facing trial in the same city that I was in. So, so that was that was the kind of um, environment we we lived through books. I have sort of a mild form of dyslexia, which is really ironic because I'm a writer now. And my primary school teachers don't believe that I've ever became a writer <laughs> because I really, really struggled with reading and writing when I was younger. Struggled really, really uh, terribly. And I have a sister that's a year older than me. She would, you know, be reading books, and and I would struggle through it. And I was much older when when I started reading, and then once I got into it, I realized, okay, I actually don't enjoy reading fiction, but I enjoy reading politics. And so I would read, you know, my old sister's political books and, and later on get access to, to libraries where I would then, you know, borrow uh, Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom, you know, Zeke Sunda or that kind of sort of genre of reading that really spoke to me, um, nonfiction. And I think that the library was a massive part of our childhood. And that's what, that would our holidays be because we'd have nothing else to do. So we just sit and read books the entire December summer holidays. So speaking about Mandela, in terms of the race issues in South Africa, how did that shape your growing up in this space? So I had a neighbor who, who now is a diplomat, but at the time she was just a social worker, but she was heavily um, involved in the ANC and she was, she identifies as, as an Indian and we socially identified as, uh, you know, uh, my mom um, was, was uh, Indian South African. And so, so, but she was involved in in the ANC and she, through her and my mom, when she was younger, she was also very much active active in the student anti-apartheid movement. And so it was almost sort of second nature to us. My, my dad, when he was well, because he had later gotten very ill, um, it was almost a thing of, you know, understanding your role, understanding, um, you know, privilege, understanding uh, re- discrimination. And then, but my introduction to, to you know, um, our history, as it were, in terms of, you know, the role of the ANC, the liberation of the country, the, the different figures beyond Mandela and beyond what you learn in school uh, came from this neighbor of mine. And she often would would give me the newspapers that I would read and I would ask her questions. And, you know, it's just uh, crazy now that, you know, yeah, she's a diplomat and and now, and she, you know, is immensely proud because she can just remember this eight-year-old asking her questions about who's this man on your, on your fridge? And she's like, no, it's Mandela or yeah. it's, you know, Tabo Mbeki or uh, whoever it may have been. You mentioned that you, you have dyslexia. How have you navigated that, especially given that you're an editor now? So how have you navigated that, you know, through the time? Yeah, so I, I have to be extra. Um, I mean, I've obviously learned to to, to to work around my limitations. It's it's not severe in any case. As I said, when I was younger, it was mostly undiagnosed because my mother who had picked it up, mm. uh, you know, that, that obviously had, I, this is not laziness or you know this is someone who who really struggles um and 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 again it's the it's the irony of it and that's why uh smartphones have been the my lifesaver because um i take notes on on my smartphone like pen to paper i put pen to paper and i cannot understand anything i've written and so (laughs) a smartphone works incredible for me i i'm able to take notes and i've learned i've learned my way around it It also because i i know that that's my limitation and, 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 and finally enough, I mean, there was obviously lots of errors in my first book that I'd written, right? So when I was writing uh, The Balance of Power, the, the book on the president, 
I was so pedantic about it that then as a result, you know, you, you're almost too particular because you know that this is your limitation and that you have density of, you know, making mistakes and in terms of writing. But it's just something that I've adopted. to. And, and you know, if I say it out loud now, you know, I, I said it to, to an editor who asked me to take notes and I said, you won't be able to read my writing. I can, I can type it out, you know, very quickly for you. Uh, and then he's like, the hell, you're a writer. And I'm like, yeah, don't really give me a pen, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it's, it's just, I just sort of refer to it as, you know, one of my quirks. But I mean, I remember being in school and being penalized for, for the fact that my teachers just couldn't read my writing. And it was just something they just couldn't do. And I sort of just learned to navigate and, and get through it. And you, you mentioned earlier on that at the age of, I think you said 17, you took a bus uh, to a new city to discuss cover the world of journalism. Yeah. Just talk us through your mindset in that moment. Like, how did you arrive at that decision? What was your emotions? What were you, you know, what were you thinking about as you were making this kind of journey on this bus and, and making your way to try to be as dogged as you've demonstrated in your explanations to get the job that you want in journalism? Yeah. So my instinct was that I had this time. I had a few months before I had to, you know, wait for my results to come out, let alone decide what I'm going to study. So I thought, okay, why not? So what I did was my mom's sister stays about 60 kilometers from Johannesburg and then I knew an aunt another just lady that I grew up with had she worked close to the office where I would remember I don't have the job I'm just like he just gave me a meeting so I had phoned her and asked her if I come to Joburg would I be able to travel with you and and, and, and this is not even Joburg because it's like 50 days away from Johannesburg and she was almost too stumped to say no <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> and and also I didn't I mean the way like when I think about it now I just it, in my mind it wasn't it wasn't meant to be a permanent thing it was like like everyone around me thought oh she's going for two weeks and she'll come back and so I would I used to tutor and I would make some money so I had that money I had a brand new BlackBerry because I had finished school and that was the gift that I had asked for so I'd gotten a, a BlackBerry which I I had paid hard for and then my mom had paid half for wow. and then I had one bag of clothes one bag of books and literally I only owned one pair of shoes and I came to Johannesburg and it was the start of winter so it was really cold and I come from a coastal hot humid climate and when I so I get onto this bus and it's you know it's it's the cheapest bus because my mom had given me the money uh, for the ticket and I said okay I can pocket if I if I take a cheaper bus I would I can pocket the change you know so I had about 500 rand in my wallet and 200 rand I had I had put in my that was the change of the ticket bus ticket that I didn't use the whole amount because I used a cheaper bus ticket and I and I put that in my sock for some weird reason and and only afterwards I would be so grateful that I did that because on arrival in Johannesburg in the very notorious uh, park station it's very notorious someone with a knife cut my handbag open and stole my wallet oh gosh <laughs> so it was it was it was a baptism of fire I it was get, like yeah welcome to Johannesburg <laughs> <laughs> you would have thought that I would have hurt my lesson and oh the amount of times I've been mugged in Johannesburg after that <laughs> and and you know what that's why I say you know it probably was stupidity because it was this naivety of this dream of sorts that was just bigger than any hurdle that came up so did it mean that I had to wake up at 4 a.m. to leave home at 5 30 to get to work at 6 30 to avoid traffic and to, you know did it mean um having to eat you know, eventually I had to pay rent from a very small salary. Um, and then, you know, did it mean eating, you know, two minute noodles? Yeah. Um, but I don't know what you guys call two minute noodles. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> it's the noodles. <laughs> it's noodles. But, you know, it, it was worth it. And I was saying to someone very recently that it's so weird that uh, it's been a 10 year hustle, effectively. And only now am I catching my breath to the point of, oh, Oh, you've achieved all of this or you know you've you've come a long way I think I looked at it as like you know it just needed to be like I had to survive to the next step and an outrageous amount of work to keep afloat whether it was not only financially but also to get ahead in my career so yes I was 
you know, producing at this radio station, but I had like begged this website, please, can you publish me? I'll write for free. And then eventually they started paying me. And then I was doing, you know, I was writing a very low paid, you know, journalist working at a newspaper, but then pleading with the political editor, hey, I will do my normal stories, but can I do political stories on my day off in the evenings or whatever? You know, it's, it's, it was then, it was then, okay, once I got a, a grip of the political space in terms of uh, newspaper reporting, okay, when can I do television? Okay, can I do television in the nights? Okay, fine. Then, you know, got my big break. Uh, then it was, okay, what is the next step going to be? Okay, you know, I'm unable to live within this very small salary. Okay, I will go back to news anchoring from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., then go to my newspaper job from 9 a.m. to 5, 6 p.m., and then still study on, on, on at evenings and, and on weekends. So that was my hustle and my drive. What you've described there is, is basically dogged determination. You knew what you wanted and you went straight after it and you did what you had to do to get what you wanted. Yeah. If you were to give 10 years on it, I mean, it's been just over 10 years, right, then, that you made this journey. What advice would you give to yourself back then? Like looking back now, looking how far you've come, going back to that time, what advice would you have given yourself at that time? Stop spending, wasting so much of money on food. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of us can, can agree to that in terms of our lives as well. I think that's definitely an advice I'd like to give myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that I should have been more respectful of the achievements that I had accomplished along the way. I think that I was very dismissive. So and I know this sounds quite bizarre, but I would, you know, I was I was 20 years old and I was having sit down interviews with the head of state. Right. Right. And in my mind, why was I not having interviews with Barack Obama? <laughs> I would beat. It sounds bizarre. It sounds completely bizarre. But I, I mean, I mean, that was the fire that was lit in me. But at the same time, it was, I think, my Achilles heel that I didn't give myself that respect to say, "Well, you've done." so much. And I think only now, and I mean, it took probably some good years of therapy. <laughs> and, and oh, another advice that I would give myself is start therapy. Like, can you not just start therapy? Because because therapy literally changed my life. Um, because of, I mean, and, and, and I think the, the hardest part of having this terrible, deter, I don't know if you call it terrible, but this, this insatiable um, determination to succeed as a journalist is that you don't take seriously the knocks that life throws at you. And so then it culminates into really, really, really uh, terrible consequences on your mental health because you had this ambition and it was all part of this big plan. Of yeah. So whether it's, you know, going on a story and seeing dead bodies or, you know, witnessing protests or being, you know, literally bullied by national politicians and ministers at a very young age and them obviously taking advantage of it. I think that I would be more cautious of the consequences of that and be a lot more gentle with myself. Mm. Let's talk a bit more about mental health. What are your experiences with it in, in, in those years? Yeah, thankfully, I come from a family where uh, my dad suffered from a mental illness. And so there was a lot of openness in my family about it. And it was something that we, in my immediate family, at least, something that we spoke about, we were, because we had to deal with it. So we had to be educated about mental illness. But obviously, when you're in the moment, you're not realizing how much, you know, sun grenades and rubber bullets and, and everything culminate. And also just the difficulty of work and life and, you know, trying to make it as a literally struggling student, you know, um, from month to month and, and trying to be a political journalist. Um, obviously, it comes the whole of, you know, baggage. And so it was only when I had hit rock bottom, I was already, one may argue, at the peak of my career in 2018, when uh, I had suffered the death of my mom, but I had to, you know, rebound very quickly because there was a big internal ANC election that had to be covered. Then it was, you know, it was just the next thing, next thing, next thing that I then started going going for intensive trauma therapy and realize how much your work and how much our lives as journalists is just, you, you can't just regard it at, you know, you know, it's that thing of you must just take it on the chin and, and keep it moving. And I, I'm very grateful for people in my life who had encouraged me to go for therapy um, in a way that made me strong enough to almost start a movement in my newsroom and then now hoping now to get it, you know, across all newsrooms to create an awareness about mental health. And I think what I did was I then I took my my experience and I said, okay, I'm gonna use this now as my ammunition to fight the the cause for mental health. And awareness 
therapists and, and for therapy and, and, and for help. And that experience, and it, remember, it sounds quite heroic. Uh, you know, oh, she was a 19-year-old journalist. She had a book published. She was a 20-year-old journalist. She won her first award, a national award. She's won, you know, this many awards. She's the, but it, it, it definitely comes with a personal toll. And, and the thing is, I, I, I was disrespectful of, 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 of how much it took from me. You know, until now where, where I was able to say, OK, this this job is going to kill me if I don't. Because I say to people, you see the highlights, right? You see the byline, you see the awards, you see the interviews and television. What you don't see is the depression of unable to get out of bed, the obesity that comes with depression, the inability to live a functioning life and have to literally outsource my life and actually not have a life outside of journalism, which is, I mean, the part where people don't tell you that you know to and I think that it can be changed I think when I started in journalism it was you know someone had sat me down one day and said can I give you a tequila because you are going to be an alcoholic so let me show you how to be a functioning one and I said you know I don't drink you know I really and she says but you will because that's the only way you're going to be able to succeed as a political reporter and you know I feel like the world has changed from that you know that that you know that gritty oh we must be you know it's almost you know don't be a pants of how it was 10 years ago. It literally was that. And I'm happy that, you know, earlier this morning, we had a webinar for uh, our subscribers at News24 um, discussing a protest movement called Fees Must Fall. Prices are worth it. But is it really? Hmm, you know? It's so great that you speak so openly about mental health and about that journey and the toll it takes on you personally. It's that balance really between your ambition to succeed in a particular field and doing what you need well not just doing what you need to do but doing what the industry di- dictates that you need to do to achieve that right um, and then also in terms of you as a human being because you've got to be alive to <laughs> reap the rewards of your, your of your hard work right so I think there's almost mental health is uh, within journalism it's not something that we speak hardly enough about. And I think there's a dialogue that needs to be had within organizations about actually uh, what is the industry doing actually, right? For people like yourself 10 years ago who were trying to get in, for people in it now, in particular, in this, how are organizations actually protecting the mental health of its journalists? I think that's a really important um, conversation to be had. And, you know, I, I love what you said earlier on about respecting your achievements along the way. And I think that's part of it. You know, having that moment of taking can stop because our that journey of getting to the point that you want to get to is almost like the new cycle as well that's so fast moving you know and so fast changing and just taking that moment of stock so really thank you so much for speaking so openly about you know the impact of all of that on your mental health i mean and i don't want to jump the gun but but just to say that i've realized and i've decided that i don't know how but mental health is going to be my next 10 years so if i can make a small difference with creating action change within journalism and mental health in journalism. I'm okay with that. But I know that if you ask me what what does the next 10 years look like, it looks like a great focus on that, a great focus on not only creating awareness, because I think in the last three years from when I started speaking about this and, and, you know, create workshops and speaking to people, there's been, uh, you know, a lot of awareness, but there has been a lot of awareness. But the problem is, the problem comes at how do you create tangible solutions and create mechanisms for help. And that's where my focus hopefully is going to be for in the next chapter of my life. And that is such an important thing that I think it's, you know, it's going to be really an interesting next step for you in your career and talking about your career I mean I'm looking at all the roles um, political reporter at TNA media political reporter at Mail and Guardian at Sunday Times and now political editor at News 24 I think South Africa more than a lot of other African countries are bet, have done better in terms of that gender balance in editorial leadership right what has been your journey to in terms of getting to this point of leadership um, we know about your you know your focus focus on politics and all that in that management um, level. What has been your kind of journey in that? Yeah. So especially in the type of, of reporter that, that I was, I never ever considered ever becoming an editor, uh, particularly because, you know, 
for the lack of a better word, I love the streets a lot and I do love the streets a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, there's a part of me, and I just, just to digress a little, there's a part of me that has a serious amount of uh, what millennials call FOMO when they speak court case, political court cases to the point that last year, you know, I sent a team down to Free State and other province to cover a very big and momentous political corruption case. And I couldn't help myself and I caught a lift and I went because <laughs> I just, you know, you know, in terms of, of, of my experience with the, with the gender balance. I think that, you know, when I started, all my editors were male. When I got to the Mail and Guardian, the editor-in-chief was a female and the political editor was a female. And that particular political editor, whom I still uh, remain very close to, her name is Menelidi Matabuke. She changed my life in the way of allowing me... A lot of what I did was, you know, self-starting and, and, you know, but what I learned from Manaledi's leadership was you can still be endearing. You can still be kind because you, you know, I had an editor at some point who would literally be drunk on the job and would throw things and, 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 you know, it almost becomes, you know, that's it. The face of leadership in journalism is an angry male. And when I worked with Manaledi, that, I mean, politicians would never not answer her calls, you know, and yet she had this very endearing, kind humanness about her. And that shaped me profoundly in ways that this is how you assert yourself in a newsroom. This is how you fight a fight. Don't lose yourself. You know, if you are not this person, if you're not this completely vicious person, and, and that for me was was incredible. Then, you know, I, I then worked into it in a newsroom or in a team that was very, you know, sort of patriarchal, one, one can even say. Um, and that experience working with Manaledi gave me the tools to see that, okay, this is patriarchy at work. And I mean, there was an experience very early on in my career in 2013 when Mandela died. Where And I mean, this, this was not malicious in any way, but this was just institutionalized patriarchy, right? Where I had covered everything. So from the moment Mandela died, all the events around his home, the memorials, the big, you know, heads of state, everything. It was, it was back to back for two weeks of coverage. We were literally working 15 hour, 16 hour days. And then it's like, you know, the epic him, the history making, Mandela being laid to rest in his hometown of Kono in the Eastern Cape. And I was told, no, Q, you can't go because we're sending so-and-so male reporter because it would be easier for him to relieve himself on the side of the road wow. in a rural area. And, and again... <laughs> That's a new one. <laughs> you know, but, but I mean, it was not malicious. It was just so second nature that a man would do this better. And it fired something in me that there was nothing, you know, I, I had got married in quite young uh, in 2015 you know up to the night before I was I I got married I was you know busy on this very big story the president at the time fired the finance minister the markets crash I literally was still busy on that story until the night before I got married you know and gave me that thing of you know but you see you see the gender imbalance you see the amount of sacrifice women journalists have to go through even though now there's almost a disproportionate I mean women are almost in the majority but but when it comes to managerial level where it really matters, it's not proportionate. And I think a lot more work needs to be done. Yeah. Also, w- what's important for me is not appointing female editors. It's easy to appoint female editors. For me, the re- re- real le- litmus test and transformation, especially about gender and, and race, is grooming female journalists and black journalists, grooming them for that position. So when they take it over, they're taking over, setting them on a path of success. That's where I find my responsibility now, having gotten into a managerial position at a very young age. I I, I was appointed political editor of News 24. I was 26. I turned 27 last year, working with a team of people who are much older than I am, even my own subordinates, you know, way older than I am. But having that support and being trained in a way that I am able to successfully execute my job as a political editor because I'm, I'm given the tools that I need to do my job correctly. And I think that had I been thrown in the deep end and just been told to swim, yeah. I think that it would have been not counterproductive for my own career, but for the promotion of women journalists. And it's, it's interesting there how kind of the onus is always kind of on the one person that makes it to that position to make sure they set a good enough example yeah. so that it doesn't start and end with them. So that's that's all about it. And that the door is not closed behind them because that's the thing. Um, it's called moral licensing, right? So they appoint one female so that, you know, oh, 
look at us. We believe in, in you know, gender parity in executive positions. And I'm, I'm saying this for corporates all over the world, not, you know, not particularly any newsroom that I've worked in. And so what happens is you are let in, but the door is firmly shut behind you. And I think that was something that I had to get through my own consciousness to say, you're opening the door for me. I'm very happy. But we have to actively keep the door open for females behind me. And, and that's the dilemma I have now where, you know, there aren't other young Conitas being given opportunities and being gambled on, you know, because the editors who had hired me at 18 and 19 literally took a gamble. You know, suffice to say, they paid me a uh, pittance, you know, <laughs> it wasn't too much of a risk. But, but with, that's where I think the problem in South Africa at the moment is, is that we're not growing our own timber in terms of political reporting. And what happens is you're relying on the same pool of political, or not even political, of just specialist journalists um, and not giving people opportunities because it's too risky to give people opportunities. And I think that I come from the experience because I was lucky enough to, to have betted on really to, to now I cannot forget that experience. And that's something that's at the foremost of my mind uh, in my work to say, how can I extend these opportunities for other people? I read somewhere that you quietly thank Jacob Suma for making your journalism career. I couldn't quite understand it. So explain that to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Jacob Zuma is the president when I started, right, as a, as a political reporter, so as, you know, 18 years old. There was not a shortage of news. And there was so much happening in the country that the editors were forced to send me out and cover these massive stories. And so I ended up becoming the unofficial Jacob Zuma reporter. And at some point, uh, at some point, I was very young. Uh, so so you're, again, you're young and you're naive and you're stupid, right? So I had nothing to lose, right? What does a 19-year-old or 20 year old have to lose. So I would just door stop the president and get the most phenomenal stories <laughs> because okay. I just didn't care, you know. Now I would think twice about door stopping a president and, you know, being okay. as flippant as I was or just as hungry as I was at the time. A lot of people misconstrue when I when I make the joke that I thank Jacob Zuma for my career is because earlier on I had worked for a TNA which Imagine. became a very much part of the Jacob Zuma patronage network. I had left, you know, once the cracks had started uh, emerging. Um, and ironically, very soon after I had left, I then started reporting on my bosses who effectively gave me an opportunity of a lifetime hiring someone in first year university to cover politics. Yet I had to then report on these same people once it became known how much of a part they had played in the looting and capturing of the South African state. And in balancing of power, you said earlier on, you wrote about um, Ramaphosa's election as, as president and South Africa. How did that book come about? And, you know, just tell us that journey of developing that book and the impact it's had. Okay, my big moment in covering politics, I mean, I'd covered for two years before that, but that was like, you know, what made me enter the big leagues. And at that conference, Ramaphosa was appointed, was elected deputy president of the ANC. And so then I had sort of followed him unofficially over the years and had, you know, covered him immensely. And then when the ANC leadership battle began, I took an immense focus on him and became close to people around him and then focused on so his election as, as president of the ANC. And then later on his election, uh, his, he then you know became president of the country and then focused my time on covering him. So I traveled with him. You know, there was thankfully I was able to, uh, you know, I, I was working at the Sunday Times. But as long as I'd given them the stories that was expected, I could I had the latitude to just travel with the president. And, you know, some of it was I'd paid for myself sometimes the Sunday Times would pay. Other times I'd hustle lips, you know, to Nigeria even. Oh, wow. <laughs> when Ramaphosa <laughs> went to Nigeria, I'd hustle the lift on his plane in his meeting with President Buhari. Yeah. The idea of how the, where the book started and where it ended, uh, you know, it obviously took a, initially it almost had like a biographical start and then it became, okay, I'm focusing in this part of history. It's very difficult to write about a president at the onset of their career. I mean, not their, not their career, but their, their presidency. Um, and, and, and it was, it was, it almost felt impossible midway through it. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know. But there was so much to write about and I was uh, trusted by so many people considering that I had been doing this for a long time to speak to me quite candidly. Um, and ironically, there's a group of people who have fallen out with the president, right? The president. Who initially used to accuse me of being his praise singer. In their fighting of him, 
are using my book to say, see, this is the smack. <laughs> so oh, I'm like, gosh. if I'm criticized by all parties, I know I was fair and objective. <laughs> so it sounds like um, there's been a lot of focus, a lot of bravery, a lot of just being really clear about what you, where you want to get in your journey. And as we round up then, if there was the one single advice you could give to the person listening to this podcast about that journey, about them taking that journey, what would that be? I think get good mentors. I think that I wouldn't have been able to do this without some level of mentorship. And I think that I'm very appreciative of the people who taught me literally in the thick of things. And I'm very respectful of that. And yes, formal training is very important. But, you know, that kind of mentorship is something, even now as a political editor, I rely on certain people to give me guidance in some of the decisions that I have to take. I think a big part of my journey has been being remaining human and understanding your strengths and weaknesses as a human being and how that you could use that, you know, in your favor or not. And I think that relying heavily on my humanity had allowed me or allowed people to trust me, politicians and newsmakers, etc., to trust me. And I think that I would not give that up, you know, that, that humanity. Uh, the third thing I think is to learning to speak up in a way that is just not noise. And for a big part of my career, I'd made noise, you know, because I, I was always a loud mouth. But then I realized, okay, noise is one thing, but how do we make meaningful change? Obviously, that comes with a little bit of power and latitude. You know, once you have power, you can make that change. But I do think that the starting conversations, difficult conversations around transformation, around uh, gender parity, about, you know, about media freedom, about brown envelope journalism, if you must, ethical journalism. I think that that those conversations must be started in a way that can affect meaningful change. And I think that's something that I would, something that I would, you know, put on top of my mind. Okay, am I making noise for the sake of making noise or am I making noise to affect change? And of course, mental health, as we've talked about earlier on and trying to make change there. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Kanita, for doing this interview. It's really a pleasure hearing your story, hearing your journey. And I'm sure people listening to this podcast would like to contact you. So what is the best way for them to get in touch with you, whether social media or email? Okay. So my social media, I'm, I'm active on Twitter. You can contact me at uh, Q-A-A-N-I-T-A-H-H-U-N-T-E-R. So at Kwanita uh, Hunter on, on Twitter, you can email me Q double A N I T A H at gmail.com. Kwanita at gmail.com. I love to chat to other colleagues in the continent and who knows, perhaps our focus on mental health journalism can become a continental wide uh, project. Agenda. Exactly. Thank you very much, Kanita. Kanita's story is that of determination and sacrifice fueled by the drive to reach the peak of her career and achieving her childhood ambition and to become a voice to reckon with in a field against all odds. I hope you find inspiration and courage from her story. If you'd like to join me on an episode of this podcast, please contact me at yemc at africanwomeninmedia.com. You can also visit our main website at africanwomeninmedia.com to find out more about our work. In the show notes, there's a list of organizations and helplines to support you if you have experienced any of the topics we have discussed today. And don't forget, join the conversation using hashtag HerMediaDiary. Her Media Diary is a product of African Women in Media, an NGO advocating for gender equality in the industry. And this episode was hosted by Dr. Yemisi Akimbobola and produced by Blessing Udobasi as part of a five-episode series on mental health in the media. All music featured in this podcast is by Nana Kwabena. Thanks for listening and join us again next time.